Hi, I'm Sarah, and welcome to my poster, which is about using single cell transcriptomics to characterize the bone marrow microenvironment in health and leukemia. So the bone marrow is a really complex tissue. It coordinates the production of billions of blood cells every day. And these blood cells start out as hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs, um, which can then go on to differentiate into multiple different types of cells. Um, and interactions between these HSCs and other types of cells in the bone marrow are really important in regulating their functions and properties. And then in the case of hematopoietic disease, these interactions will be dysregulated. Um, so AML is an aggressive blood cancer, uh, which causes an accumulation of these myeloid lineage um, blood cell precursors in the bone marrow. Um, and unfortunately, the survival rate is quite poor um, because most patients will eventually develop drug resistance, which is largely driven by the protective uh, microenvironment in the bone marrow where these leukemic cells reside. Um, so it's thought that these leukemic cells depend tightly on signals from other types of cells in the bone marrow that encourage them to proliferate and survive. But it's not quite clear what these signals are or what cell types might be involved. So that's what we have set out to characterize. So what we've done is perform single cell RNA sequencing on bone marrow aspirates from 10 patients with AML. Um, and then we've integrated the data with some publicly available data sets um, from both healthy and AML bone marrow. Um, so because there's so much heterogeneity between AML patients, we figured it was really important to try and include as many donors as possible in this analysis so that we could try and look for patterns that might be common across patients. Um, and then we've used this tool called SC Arches to try and integrate the data, um, which uses a machine learning approach to try and overcome the batch effects between samples. And it does a really good job of mixing the data sets so that the cells um, cluster by cell type. So you can see this is pre-integration. The cells are clustering by data set. And then after integration, the data sets are mixed and the cells are instead clustering by um, cell type. So our combined data set consists of around 340,000 cells from 63 different donors. And we've managed to identify 19 different cell types in this data set, including the, the HSC population, um, and then multiple different um, myeloid, lymphoid, and erythroid lineage cells. Um, and we've also managed to identify these really rare cell populations, the mesenchymal cells and megakaryocytes. So neither of these populations had been labeled in any of the data sets prior to integration. But that's the, the benefit of having this really large integrated data set is that you can, there's enough of these like rare cell populations that they um, can separate out and form their own clusters. Um, so although we do have samples from AML patients post-treatment and at relapse, the majority of our data comes from healthy and diagnosis samples. So that's where we've focused most of our analysis so far. And you can see there's a really significant difference in cell type composition between the healthy and diagnosis samples. Um, so you can see there's these um, lymphoid progenitor cells. Um, so these common lymphoid progenitors and pre-B cells in the, in the healthy samples that are nearly disappeared in the diagnosis samples. Um, and even the mature lymphoid populations, um, like the, the T and NK cells and the B cells, these make up um, a much larger proportion of cells in the healthy sample compared to the diagnosis samples. Like these are really depleted in the diagnosis samples. And instead you just have a really huge proportion of um, these HSCs. Um, so then we asked the question, how are these HSCs communicating with other cell types in the bone marrow and how might that change at the onset of AML? Um, so we do this by looking at the expression of genes that code for ligands and receptors that are known to interact with each other and, um, and looking to see like what pairs of cell types are expressing these ligand and receptor genes. Um, so we use this tool called Liana, which runs multiple different methods for predicting cell-cell interactions and then gives you um, like an aggregate consensus score for each interaction. So um, it avoids calling too many false positives. So we identified uh, over a thousand interactions um, in both the healthy and the diagnosis samples. And we saw a really similar pattern between the two time points. Um, and that's that the the majority of interactions involving HSCs 
were um, between HSEs and these mesenchymal cells, um, followed by megakaryocytes and then also um, monocytes. So then we tried to figure out what these interactions might be doing and what pathways might be involved. So we annotated the ligand and receptor genes with KEG pathways um, and then looked to see which pathways were, were most common at the different time points. Um, and again, we see a similar pattern um, at, the, at the different time points in that the most frequent pathways are common between the two. Um, but for example, you can see that these um, cell adhesion, cytokine receptor, um, natural killer cell mediated cytotoxicity, these um, pathways, there was much more of them annotated in the diagnosis samples compared to the healthy samples. Um, so our hope is that by further investigating these interactions and maybe trying to find interactions that are unique to or significantly up or down regulated in the AML samples, that we can try and figure out um, what signals might be responsible for encouraging these cells to proliferate and survive. Um, and in that way, maybe hopefully identify some potential therapeutic targets. Um, but that's all I have for now anyway. So thank you for listening and feel free to ask me any questions.